So we are very happy to have Matthew from IPMU. And he will tell us about the singularities of thermal correlators at strong capital. Please start. OK, so I wanted to thank the organizers for having me here. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be talking about singularities of, uh, of thermal correlation functions at strong coupling. Uh, this is based on work in progress with Hiroshi Uguri, um, who's at IPMU and may be joining us today. So here's a, here's a quick outline. Um, I'll start by uh, motivating the result using the bulk point singularity, uh, which is a singularity in, in correlation functions in, in ADS-CFT. Uh, then I'll uh, generalize this uh, singularity to uh, thermal correlators, uh, the thermal two-point function, um, uh, by studying the uh, light cone of an ADS black hole. And in, in the main part of in the main part of my talk, it's, uh, sections uh, three through five, I'll resolve these new singularities in, in correlation functions. And then I'll conclude with some generalizations and uh, future directions. So that's where we're going. So let's uh, start by reviewing uh, the bulk point singularity. Um, so the question, of, uh, the question of interest is what kinds of singularities can arise in correlation functions in conformal field theory. Um, in quantum field theory, uh, this is a very uh, a fundamental question in, in the context of the scattering matrix because uh, poles um, in, in, in scattering amplitudes are physical states. Um, so, it, uh, so we're trying to, uh, to, uh, to address it, uh, the same question, but now in, in correlation functions in conformal field theory. So what kinds of singularities can arise? Um, in Euclidean signature, there's not much. Uh, there's just the OPE singularity. Uh, so that happens when two operators approach the, uh, uh, the same point and we get a parallel divergence um, uh, uh, proportional to uh, their distance to the two times their scaling dimension. So uh, this is not that interesting um, because it's completely determined by conformal invariance and and doesn't contain uh, much information. In uh, a Lorentzian signature, um, things are a bit more interesting uh, because we can have singularities at non-coincident points, uh, namely at points that are not on top of each other. So th uh, the obvious example is, is a, uh, the light cone singularity. Uh, we can have two points that are light-like separated in the correlator, and then the, uh, there will be a, a divergence in the correlation function. So that's the obvious example. Um, a more uh, uh, tricky example is called a, a Landau singularity. Uh, this happens when we can draw a Feynman diagram that has only light-like lines in position space. So we have some vertices and some lines, and, and all, all the lines are light rays. And that leads to, uh, to, a, singular, uh, to a singularity in, in correlation functions. So perturbatively, that's all of them. Um, and in fact, you can show that in, in one plus one uh, dimensional CFT, um, there cannot be any, any more singularities. Uh, but non-perturbatively, there could be more. And uh, that's the question that uh, we want to ask. Um, so one regime where we can uh, address this question is in the holographic regime. In this regime, what happens is that there are Landau diagrams in the bulk now. And, and this leads to singularities in boundary correlators uh, called bulk point singularities. Um, and this is first pointed out by Gary Giddings and Penadonis in, in 09. So here I, I drew the, uh, the configuration of four points X1 through X4 on the boundary. And there are some uh, light rays that go into the bulk and, and hit a bulk point P. And that leads to a Landau singularity in the bulk. And uh, the form of the, uh, of the divergence is, is given here. It's one over Z, uh, Z minus Z bar to some power. Uh, and Z and Z bar are the conformal cross ratios. Um, However, for these kinematics, there's actually no Landau diagram on the boundary. So it seems like this is a, 
uh, really a, a new singularity in, in, the, in the theory um, that is not probed by um, uh, perturbation theory. However, we have to remember that uh, we, can uh, uh, we can only apply a, a local field theory in the bulk if we take the strict limit where the Hutuft coupling and n go to infinity. Um, if instead we keep the string coupling finite and we sum up all the stringy corrections, we find that the, uh, uh, the singularity is actually smoothed out uh, by the expansion of the world sheet. Uh, so there's no longer a sharp uh, point P in, in the bulk and the singularity, uh, the singularity is resolved. Uh, uh, this was uh, due to Malasena, uh, Zhiboedov, and Sims Duffin in, in 15. So last year, Hiroshi and I showed that um, uh, this uh, result can be generalized a bit. Um, in, in higher dimensions, the only singularities of correlation functions um, occur when there's a, a boundary Landau diagram. So, um, uh, uh, so that uh, classifies uh, uh, singularities of, of correlation functions in higher dimensions. And now we want to try to extend this result to non-vacuum states, like, uh, like a thermal state. So what, what can we say about a thermal state? Um, at, at finite temperature, uh, conformal invariance is broken. So um, uh, we can, uh, the first question to ask is what happens in the two-point function? So in, a, in other words, we're interested in, in the singularities of this function. Here, t and phi are the time and the, and the, and the angle on the boundary. And it's, it's a finite temperature beta. And we want to know where the singularities are. So there, uh, there's some simple limits that we can take uh, before analyzing this, uh, this problem in, in detail. So uh, the first limit is at infinite volume in one plus one dimensions. Um, in this case, we can conformally map to the plane. So the, uh, the only singularity is at uh, t equals plus or minus phi, uh, which is on the light cone. So that's one limit. In free field theory, you can just compute it. And, and again, there are no singularities. Uh, besides the, uh, the ordinary uh, light cone singularities. Um, and, and a third example would be a, a, a rational theory in, in, in one plus one dimensions um, where you can show that there's no new, uh, new singularities. So we, my goal in, in the rest of this talk is to discuss the holographic limit. Are there any new singularities uh, uh, which would be analogous to the bulk point singularity? And if so, are they really singularities or are they resolved at finite string coupling? Are there any questions on the motivation before I move on? Okay, so, uh, so now I wanna study uh, uh, the light cone of an ADS black hole, um, which will give us uh, the singularities of the two point function in the holographic limit. So, um, Singularities of the boundary two-point function happen when the boundary points are separated by a null geodesic in the bulk. So we should study null geodesics in the bulk, uh, which is an ADS d plus one black hole. Um, and here I'll, uh, I'll remind you the metric. If we have a time coordinate, a radial coordinate, and uh, d minus one angular coordinates, and the function f of r is given by this, it's it's dependent on the dimension. Here, G Newton is equal to one in some units. And um, uh, we can consider geodesics on the, on the equator of the sphere because uh, we have rotational invariance. And for those geodesics, the conserved quantities are E and L, the, uh, the angular momentum and the, and the energy of the geodesic. And, um, uh, the space of all null geodesics is parameterized by their ratio E over L, and the radial motion is uh, determined by this equation. R, R dot squared equals E squared minus 2V. Uh, v is some potential. And this looks like a, a particle in, in one dimension uh, moving in a potential that's uh, dependent on, on, the, on the coordinate. So here I plotted it for D equals five, and uh, qualitatively, it looks the same for D uh, greater than two. 
um, uh, we see that for d, uh, d equals five, there's a maximum in fact. Um, but that's called the photon sphere. Um, it's the closest you can come. It's the closest you can come on an ingoing light ray, and still escape. Uh, for d equals two, what happens is that this uh, this function uh, no longer has a maximum, and and all light rays are are just uh, sucked into the black hole, um, and um, yeah. So for uh, so for uh, for any d greater than two, there are geodesics that start at infinity. Uh, uh, come in and escape uh, back out to infinity. And these give singularities in the two-point function. So um, uh, before calculating this in, in detail, um, I'm sorry, I should cite um, the first time this was um, uh, pointed out uh, to my knowledge was by Hubeni, Liu, and, and Rangamani in, in 2006. We will generalize the results of a bit and then uh, resolve the singularity. So um, uh, uh, let's try to study these uh, these geodesics in in a in a qualitative uh, fashion. So uh, the first kind of geodesic just uh, stays at the boundary. It's a null geodesic that just goes around the cylinder and uh, it never gets into the bulk. Uh, so that I drew here. Um, uh, the second type of geodesic is a geodesic that stays uh, very far from the black hole. So, um, so it it doesn't see the uh, uh, the curvature of the black hole, um, and it only it only thinks it's in ADS space, approximately. Uh, now, uh, uh, we know that uh, null geodesics in in ADS space have um, have angle uh, delta phi equals pi. And also their time difference is pi. And so therefore, in, in this limit, where the turning point is very far from the black hole, we have delta phi of order pi. And I drew that here. And uh, the final type of geodesic is one that wraps the photon sphere many times. So it, uh, so it comes in, it, it, it comes up to the maximum of this potential, it stays there for a long time, and then it rolls back down. Um, and that looks like this. Uh, uh, the green circle is is um, is the photon sphere, and it stays there for a while, and then comes back out. So, in a while, in on the next page, I'll I'll uh, draw these uh, singularities. Bef uh, before that, I just wanted to compute them. So here, I wanted to find r plus and r minus first. So um, in this equation, r dot squared equals e squared minus two v. On the right-hand side, there's uh, uh, there's zeros of this equation, and um, here I'm in d equals five, and so there are uh, four zeros, um, and we uh, we can call them r plus, r minus, and and minus r plus and minus r minus. And uh, r plus is is uh, the turning point of the geodesic, so it's it's the it's the closest the geodesic uh, gets to the black hole. R minus is at a radius smaller than the photon sphere. And so the geodesic uh, uh, never gets there. Um, it would be the turning point for a geodesic that started inside the photon sphere. So that's what our plus and our minus are. And now we can just integrate this equation. And we get e elliptic integrals because that's what, uh, there's a quartic uh, polynomial here. And uh, it's an elliptic k function of r minus squared over r, r plus squared. And uh, uh, delta t is a is a similar it's a similar elliptic integral. Uh, so that's not all. Um, once the geodesic uh, uh, gets back out to the boundary, it can uh, bounce off the boundary because we're in a finite. Um, uh, uh, we're in a space with a boundary and uh, uh, null geodesics can bounce off. And that leads to um, more singularities that just come from uh, geodesics uh, coming back into the bulk after they bounce off the boundary. So this will all be uh, become clear on the next slide. Okay, so uh, uh, this slide should contain all the, all the information you need to know about the singularity. 
so this is a picture of the boundary. Um, uh, uh, phi is the angular coordinate. It's identified with uh, uh, phi with phi plus two pi, and, and that's what these uh, dashed lines are. Uh, T is the time coordinate. And we have these red and these blue lines. Uh, the, uh, the red line is a, is a null geodesic on the boundary. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the ordinary null singularity. All these blue lines are null geodesics that go, uh, go into the bulk. So let's uh, look at them in, in more detail. Uh, so this first, uh, this first branch here is a geodesic that uh, comes in from infinity and escapes out to the boundary and uh, uh, doesn't bounce off at all. And so we see that it starts at, at phi equals pi and uh, t equals pi. Uh, so that's the, uh, the kinematics for a, a geodesic in, in approximately ADS space. And so that was uh, uh, the that was the picture here, uh, the early time limit here. Uh, so that's this limit. And then at, at late times, uh, this approaches a straight line, uh, and we'll see why in a second. But that's a geodesic that wraps uh, the photon sphere many times. So uh, this uh, third one. And then we have these higher branches. On the second branch, we have a geodesic that uh, bounces off once and and goes back in and then and then escapes back out to the boundary. Uh, similarly for the third branch, and then there are uh, many more branches above. Uh, so, uh, so that's the picture of the singularities. So as I said before, we can take some limits. Um, and in the early time limit, uh, uh, the turning point approaches infinity. And so delta t and, and delta phi are approximately pi. In the uh, late time limit, the geodesic uh, uh, wraps around the photon sphere many times. And so what that means is that it spends most of its time near the photon sphere. And so its velocity is approximately uh, the velocity of uh, photons on the photon sphere. And that's equal to the square root of GTT over GT phi at, at the photon sphere, um, which is uh, uh, this uh, constant quantity. And that would just be the slope of this line at very late times. So there's another interesting point here, which is if we if we instead identify phi with phi plus two pi in this picture, uh, singularities can actually intersect at, at a lot of different caustic points. So a, a cost a caustic point is where uh, uh, two different uh, null geodesics um, uh, connect the same two points, and so we see that there's a lot of caustic points here. Um, so uh, clearly, there's a very uh, complicated structure of singularities in this case. So uh, uh, that told us uh, uh, the positions, uh, the position of the singularities. And now we want to know what the correlation function looks like as we approach the singularity. So when the two points are connected by a slightly space-like geodesic, uh, uh, then we can use a, uh, the geodesic approximation. So we approach the null singularity in a, in a space-like direction. And the correlator is equal to e to the minus uh, mass of the particle times uh, the renormalized length, where the renormalized length is uh, uh, the length minus log of the cutoff. And we can use the, uh, the ge uh, geodesic equation to compute this, um, subtracting uh, log of r max squared. r max is the cutoff. And we get minus log e squared minus l squared. So um, finally, we want the correlation function not in terms of e and l, uh, uh, which are bulk quantities, but um, uh, t and phi, uh, which are boundary quantities. And uh, uh, to translate between them, we can just integrate the geodesic equations. And we find these formulas. Um, and uh, we can solve them for uh, delta t and delta phi, or t and phi in this equation. So um, uh, for instance, at late times, um, when the geodesic 
uh, gets very close to the photon sphere, we get a very simple power law sing uh, singularity. Um, and it's, it goes like V photon times T minus phi to the minus two M, um, where M is the mass. Uh, uh, so this looks a lot like the ordinary uh, light cone singularity, except for this factor of the photon velocity. Uh, so that's uh, the form of the singularity. And um, now we want to study it. So are, are there any questions about uh, the kinematics or the uh, derivation of this uh, singularity? Well, that photon velocity it's, is faster than the speed of light. Did I understand that right? You mean the speed of light on the boundary? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it looks on the boundary like these are actually uh, uh, super uh, super luminal, uh, uh, like they're like these blue lines are outside of the ordinary light cone. Uh, but in fact, once you identify um, uh, phi with phi plus two pi, uh, you see that these points are actually inside the light cone. Because if we we can translate this point uh, to that point, um, uh, but in indeed this. Uh, this, what about the slope of it? The slope yeah. of it being so the uh, the slope of it is indeed is indeed um, uh, faster than the boundary speed of light. Yes. Right. So if I'm looking at what two points am I looking at if I'm uh, seeing a singularity? Wouldn't it be two points on that slope well, of the uh, line? Maybe it may be uh, more uh, easier to see if you show the second next one. If, uh, Here. Yeah. Should, yeah. Yes. So here we have all the points inside the light cone. Um, oh, I see. So the singularity is between the origin point and a point yeah. up on one of those blue zigzag lines. Exactly. Yeah, I, I should have said that. So the, uh, the origin is the is the initial point, and then yep. these blue lines are the location of the second point. Right. I see. Great. Okay. So um, uh, now I want to turn to a seemingly different topic, which is string theory in the Penrose limit. So we found new singularities in the thermal two-point function. And I told you that they're not there in free field theory. So this seems a lot like the bulk point sing uh, singularity. Uh, there's a singularity that, uh, that emerges at, at infinite coupling, but, uh, but in, in that case, it's actually resolved if we take large but finite uh, tuft coupling. So is this case uh, uh, similar? In other words, are these thermal singularities an artifact of infinite lambda? So first of all, how do we even address this question? Um, string theory in a black hole is very complicated and it's some interacting sigma model. Um, but we don't really need the full theory in the black hole. We only want to study the theory in the vicinity of the null geodesic that we're interested in, because all the physics is uh, taking place uh, near the uh, near the null geodesic. So we need some way to zoom in on the null geodesic, and this is called taking the Penrose limit. So uh, the Penrose limit associates to a metric G and a null geodesic uh, gamma, a uh, plane wave uh, matrix A, A, B. So A and B here are, they run over uh, uh, D minus two coordinates in uh, uh, D bulk dimensions. And um, they, we have a transverse vector X and we have a, a null uh, two null coordinates u and v. Uh, uh, u here is is the proper time along the uh, uh, null geodesic, and v is another uh, a null coordinate. And a is the Riemann curvature tensor uh, uh, projected onto uh, gamma. And this metric, it it's it, it describes the uh, the limiting behavior of the of the metric G in the vicinity of gamma. And the plane wave matrix A uh, captures all the tidal effects. 
So, uh, so in other words, if we have some extended object uh, near the null geodesic, then A captures the, uh, uh, the tidal force on that, on that extended object. And in our case, these extended objects will be strings. So let's uh, uh, review a couple examples. So if we have a, if we have a maximally symmetric space time, then um, there's no tidal force near uh, uh, null geodesics. And so A, A, B equals zero. So, th uh, so the Penrose limit is flat space. So for instance, in, in ADS, the Penrose, uh, the Penrose limit is, is flat space. Um, a second example in, in string theory um, is the plane wave limit of ADS CFT, also known as the BMN uh, limit. It, in this case, we take ADS5 cross S5 as the space time, and we have a null geodesic in S5 on, on, the, on the equator of S5. Um, in this case, AAB is actually constant. So that's, uh, uh, those are the two simplest examples of uh, the of this uh, uh, construction. Now, um, for point particles, um, uh, we can study the uh, the Lagrangian on the on the world line. So we have some uh, world line theory, and that's equal to this. So uh, this is g mu nu times x dot square, and it, and it looks like a free theory except for this middle term, a b x a x b u dot squared, um, which looks like it's it's um, it's a highly interacting term, and so this uh, still looks very complicated. Um, uh, but in fact, it, it's a it's a quadratic theory, and to see this, we can fix the light cone gauge, which is u equals p minus times uh, tau, uh, uh, where tau is the is the is the time on the world line. And then the equations of motion become completely uh, quadratic. Um, X double dot is P minus squared uh, times A, uh, the matrix A times X. So th uh, uh, this is just a, a collection of harmonic oscillators and they have this uh, frequency here, uh, which is a uh, time dependent frequency. And so we basically have quantum mechanics uh, with some possibly uh, coupled harmonic oscillators um, and we can just uh, study this problem using uh, the techniques of quantum mechanics. Uh, so clearly from this question, uh, from this um, equation, uh, we would be interested in the eigenvalues of A because those are the masses of this, of this problem. And for vacuum solutions, we have that the trace of A equals zero. So that means that some of the uh, the eigenvalues of A are positive and some are negative, and th and the positive ones lead to unstable directions, so, and so that will be important for us. So that was point particles. Um, we can also study strings uh, using the same formulas. So this was first uh, done by Horowitz and Steiff in 1990. And all we need to do is to expand into the Fourier modes because the uh, the world sheet theory is independent of, of sigma. It, it preserves uh, uh, translation of variance on the circle. And so and so now we, we get these new equations in motion. X double dot is, is P minus squared A uh, minus N squared uh, times X. And the only difference is this factor N here, or N squared. Um, and so now we have an infinite number of harmonic oscillators and, and they can be coupled, um, uh, but it's still just harmonic oscillators. So in order uh, to, uh, uh, to study this equation in, in general, um, there are several approximations uh, that could work. So the first uh, possibility is if uh, P minus squared times A is highly localized. In this case, it could be approximated by a, de a delta function. And in fact, for us, this will be the case at, at early times uh, for geodesics that are far, are far away from the black hole. And in this case, the analysis is, is pretty similar to strings in a shock wave 
which are uh, which has a a delta function um, um, interaction term. So that was uh, studied by uh, Giddings, Gross, and Maharana in 07. So that's one limit. Uh, the opposite limit is is if the frequency is approximately constant. It's not very fast, but it's it, it's constant. So in, in this limit, we can apply the adiabatic approximation or the or the WKB approximation. Uh, and and for us, this will be the case at late times when the geodesic uh, gets very uh, very close to the photon sphere. So note that if an eigenvalue of, of p minus square times a is large and positive here, uh, then in fact we have a lot of unstable modes, because as long as as long as this uh, uh, frequency is imaginary, in other words, as, as long as the term in parentheses is positive, the mode is is unstable, and if uh, uh, p minus squared times a is large, uh, then there are a lot of n for uh, for which that's true, and so we get a lot of instability at large p minus. So that was just a a general analysis of this problem. So for an ADS-5 black hole, we can specialize a bit. Um, and the, uh, the plane wave takes this very simple form. Um, so here, A11 is, is a, a combination of the, of the RT5 uh, directions, and the other directions are along the S3. And all three are proportional to, uh, to L squared over R to the sixth. Uh, uh, note that uh, this vanishes at large R because uh, large R is, is ADS. And also know that the trace is equal to zero. And the third thing to note is that this is a, uh, di a, a diagonal matrix. And so the oscillators are not coupled. Uh, they're completely, uh, completely independent. And so a good way to draw this is to start with a circular string uh, that's uh, near the null geodesic, and it comes into the it comes in along the null geodesic, and what happens to it? Well, it'll be tidally disrupted. And so after it comes out of the black hole, it'll have a, a different shape. Um, in the in the radial directions, it, it'll it'll um, be pulled out uh, uh, pulled outward by this unstable mode. In the spherical directions, it'll be it'll be contracted, so it, it'll come out uh, looking like an elongated cigar, I guess. Are there any questions about the Penrose limit? Okay, if not, um, let's. Can I, can I just make sure I, knew, I know where you're, why you're doing this, and where you're headed with it? So yes. you're thinking that you're going to replace these. Feynman diagrams that would have given a Landau singularity by string diagrams at world sheet so diagrams. Our... And then you're looking at how that world sheet, um, let's say saddle point would behave in the neighborhood of this null geodesic. So in our case, we actually don't have a Landau. It's much simpler than the bulk point singularity because we just have a light cone singularity. And so, uh, uh, but what you said is- Okay, but, uh, okay, yeah. So, so where I'm going is to is to st uh, study the world sheet theory uh, uh, near this light cone, and to study the stringy uh, fluctuations of the world sheet. So I think what you said is is, is correct. Um, so we want to see if that suppresses the singularity. Right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So let's uh, begin at at early times. Okay, so as I said before, uh, the uh, the early time limit is uh, t and phi uh, near pi, because that's uh, the case for an uh, for an ADS geodesic. Um, now, in this talk, I'll, I'll compute a slightly simpler quantity than the bulk to bulk, uh, uh, than the boundary to boundary propagator. Um, I'll compute uh, the bulk to bulk propagator uh, near the light cone. So this removes a lot of complications. Um, now, how do we compute that quantity? Um, it, it, uh, so usually in, in, in string theory, we don't compute propagators in space time, uh, but in fact, it's, it's fine uh, to do it if you want to, because it's while invariant. Um, 
uh, the reason is because it's the path integral uh, uh, with two de uh, de boundary states at the, at, at the two external points. And so that's a while invariant quantity. Um, in space time, it's off shell, but um, on the world sheet, it's fine. Um, so this path integral it is equal to um, the, uh, the, uh, the path integral over all the transverse fields times e, e to the i s. And so we get a zero mode piece, G zero, uh, which is uh, just the world line action. And then we get uh, uh, the fluctuation uh, uh, determinants at, at one loop around, around that zero mode piece. And so we have to take the product over all A, over all the transverse modes, um, and over all N of all the of all the uh, determinants here. So if we really wanted to compute these uh, determinants, we could. Um, and we could use something called the, uh, uh, the gelfand uh, Yaglom theorem, which um, computes the determinants without computing the, uh, the eigenvalues. Um, and you know you can compute it uh, pretty easily, uh, but in this talk I'll just compute the magnitude because uh, that'll be sufficient for our our arguments here. And the reason I'll I'll be doing this is I want to uh, uh, bound uh, the propagator on the light cone, uh, give an upper bound for it, um, and and show that it's not uh, not infinity, um, and therefore that the singularity must be resolved on the light cone. Which string theory are you considering? Um, we're just looking at the, at the bosonic modes. Um, we won't need, you know, the higher dimensions or anything. Um, um, but yeah, uh, uh, we could just consider some uh, uh, critical uh, string theory and look at the bosonic subse uh, subsector. Okay. Um, right. So. Um, uh, so if we're just interested in the magnitude of the de of the de uh, uh, determinants, um, we can simplify things a lot because um, the, uh, the interpretation of the magnitude of the uh, determinants is that we have some uh, time-dependent harmonic oscillators, and so we, we make some uh, particles. So, uh, so, uh, so in other words, the final vacuum is not equal to uh, to the initial vacuum. It, it's um, it's a super uh, a super uh, position of excited states, and uh, the magnitude of this uh, determinant is just equal to the overlap of the of the in and out states. And so we just need to analyze the uh, the particle production in this in, in this theory. So now let's do it. Um, so this plane wave matrix at early times becomes very simple um, if you plug in all the all the quantities. So here, epsilon is r, r plus squared over p minus l. So we, in particular, in the large p minus regime, epsilon is small. And so therefore, this plane wave is highly concentrated at, at tau equals zero. And so what that means is that we can use this uh, shock wave approximation. So there's a, a, a very quick interaction at the, at the origin. And otherwise, uh, the theory is completely free. So, so for instance, we can solve for, uh, for x1. So uh, uh, just integrating the equations of motion um, uh, uh, near the origin gives that the, uh, the derivative of x1 at the origin is uh, disc uh, discontinuous uh, by this amount. So this is uh, pretty similar to uh, the technique that you use to solve the delta function potential in ordinary quantum mechanics, except that here we're in uh, here uh, delta is a time variable, and in in that case it, it, it's a position variable, uh, but the uh, technique is the same. So uh, we can solve these equations by um, uh, by making this uh, uh, free ansatz. So we have some uh, free pro uh, free propagation for tau less than zero, some free pro uh, propagation for tau greater than zero, and there's some a's and b's, 
and uh, solving this equation gives that uh, uh, B is, is a non-trivial uh, uh, linear combination of, of A and a, a dagger. And so therefore there's uh, particle production and the Bogolyubov uh, coefficient uh, beta is given by this three pi m p minus l over four n r plus to the fourth. And so the magnitude of the, uh, uh, so, uh, so the, uh, the overlap of the initial and the final state of the initial and the final state is given by one over one plus beta squared. Um, and at very large mode number n, we see that this is very small. And so that means that we're making a lot a lot of uh, uh, stringy modes at at very large p minus, and uh, that will be important for us. Could you just remind me where on the trajectory tau equals zero corresponds to where the yeah. shock is happening and why? Yeah, so it's just the turning point. So the the, uh, the particle comes in and it hit and it hits the uh, the turning point, and at the turning point. It, is where all the all the all the interaction is happening. Yeah. And why is it so localized? I would have thought it's a kind of smooth turning point for a geodesic. Yeah, it's it's localized in time. It's it's not it's not localized in the radius coordinate, but in 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 the world sheet time it is. Yeah. Right, but still you it's somehow that's enough for is it happening close to no, it's not even that close to the horizon. No, no. It's, oh. So the, the reason we get a large uh, tidal force is because large P minus is us being very close uh, to the light cone. So uh, the, uh, the closer and closer we get to the light cone, uh, uh, the higher the center of mass energy is between the uh, geodesic and the black hole. And so th uh, there can be a large effect even though we're uh, very far away from the black hole. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, but I'm still not quite seeing why, as far as excitation of the string oscillators is concerned, the string experiences it as a as a short shock, you know, so that you can use this approximation. So uh, um, I'm asking for an intuition, really. Right. Right. Well, yeah. So it's, uh, uh, certainly, it needs to be somewhat localized uh, uh, near the turning point because very far away from the turning point, uh, the tidal tensor is zero, right? And so, and so all that means is, is that um, in the time coordinate um, at, at, at very large energy, at very large P minus, um, uh, uh, that localization is, is a small time. So I guess P minus has to be so large that compared to the mass of the string excitations, or, it's it's a lot of energy. Yeah. In other words, the the fact that they're massive, their intrinsic frequencies are not that are overwhelmed by p minus or something like that. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, why you say that at large n this quantity is much smaller than one? Uh, sorry, I meant for small. Sorry, I, I meant for small. Small right. n and large p minus. Okay. okay. Thank you for, okay. for that clarification. Good. Uh, so now we can multiply all these uh, determinants together to get the answer uh, for the magnitude here. And it, it looks like one over cinch up to some power. And one over cinch is very small. In fact, it's exponentially small in p, in p minus. So that's a, the, uh, the overlap in the, uh, of the initial and the final state is extremely small, large p minus. Uh, so a lot of modes are, are made, a lot of stringy modes are made. Uh, finally, we need the zero mode dependence on p minus, uh, but that's easily determined to be square to p minus. And uh, uh, the way to, uh, to understand this is that the reason that the propagator is singular on the light cone is because the Fourier transform of square to p minus is infinite. Um, uh, there's a, a divergence as we go to uh, large p minus in that in that interval. So what happens once we include the strings? Well, it's no longer uh, uh, divergent because uh, this uh, cinch factors 
uh, these uh, stench factors cancel uh, the, uh, the uh, divergence, and there's an exponential uh, suppression at large p minus. So the answer is, is bounded and it's fine. And so uh, the light cone singularity is, is resolved. So the, uh, the interpretation is that at very large p minus, we make a lot of strings. Um, so the probability for a particle to, uh, to remain uh, just an ordinary particle on the light cone is small. Good. You said you make a lot of strings, but you meant you excite the string a lot? Yes, sorry, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mode production in the first pontos, not second pontos. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. Whichever one is on, is on the word sheet, it, that's what the mode production is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, uh, uh, that was the story at, at early times. And uh, I don't have too much time left, but I'll, I'll talk about the singularity re uh, resolution at, at late times then. Actually, I think I should be good on, on time. So now let's turn to the opposite limit. The geodesic uh, winds around the photon sphere many times. And the approximation is the exact opposite. It's no longer a short interaction. It's a long, it's a long interaction with a, approximately uh, a constant frequency. And uh, this, is perfect, uh, this is perfect for the WKB approximation. So let's apply that. So as I said before, um, in, the in the adiabatic approximation, um, we have a large number of growing modes at large p minus, a large number of unstable modes at, at large p minus, and they have, uh, they have imaginary frequencies because they're unstable. And so the way to see that is that here this, fre uh, this frequency squared is equal to n squared minus uh, this factor proportional to p minus squared. And so there's a lot of n for which this is negative. And in, in particular, the number of unstable modes, it grows like p minus. So that uh, sounds like we're going to get a lot of instabilities. So let's uh, uh, find that now. Um, so, uh, so for the adiabatic approximation, uh, the growing solution is equal to this. Here, uh, we take the absolute value of the uh, the absolute value of the frequency integrate up to u and therefore the number of produced particles is given by the square of that quantity um, and so this is uh, this is again an exponential so now in our case we can plug in this uh, time dependent frequency that we had and what we find for very small little uh, a, a little n is that the number of produced modes is large because it's proportional to the turning point minus r photon uh, uh, to the minus fourth power, and it's independent of n. So uh, uh, the interpretation is because uh, uh, the, uh, the geodesic uh, passes very close to the photon sphere and it spends a lot of, a lot of time there for making a lot of modes. Uh, uh, so this is large and independent of n, and we have of order and, and unstable uh, uh, modes. And so we just uh, uh, take the product from n, n equals one to capital one, uh, to capital n unstable of this um, quantity n. And um, uh, the, uh, the overlap of the in and the out state is equal uh, uh, to this uh, product. And that's just exponential to the minus constant uh, times n and unstable. And so uh, C here is, is some constant involving R plus and R photon. And at large P minus, bec uh, because N unstable is proportional to P minus, uh, this is again exponentially suppressed. I'm a little confused at why the long time of circling around the black hole many times is somehow leading to extra excitation. I mean, it's more, more like as it's winding around the black hole, it's a kind of stationary situation, quasi-stationary. Yeah. So yeah. what is doing the exciting? Uh, so so it's, it's like we have a harmonic oscillator. It's like we have a growing mode with a constant frequency, and it just keeps growing. Um, so it, it grows for the whole time that 
the, uh, uh, the particle is close to the photon sphere. So the, uh, the tidal force is, is, is non-zero the whole time. Um, wow, okay, so it's like, uh, the, you could say the string extension, the string tension is not enough to preclude the string, the tidal force the string is experiencing from stretching it out. Right, because exciting it. exactly because we're at large p minus, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the the, uh, the whole thing is is predicated on this large energy um, configuration. So that's completely. It's not. I guess it's not intuitive because we're used to thinking of strings at rest, and you know, in that case, nothing interesting will happen. But yeah, um, yeah so. You, you can treat this a little bit more carefully by looking at n of order and, and unstable and, and, you, and you can compute the constant c. And the magnitude of the propagator on the light cone is this exponentially damped factor times um, the zero mode propagator. Again, it's completely finite at large p minus and all is well. Um, so the, uh, the lesson, is that there's no uh, there's no uh, new singularities. Um, uh, the blue curves in my in my picture from before are completely resolved. So let me just uh, display that picture. So here we have these blue curves. Uh, this one, this one, uh, and this one, and they're all not really singularities. They're all uh, they're only singularities at large at infinite lambda. Uh, uh, this red curve is of course uh, still a singularity. Um, because it's the ordinary light cone. Okay, so um, I'll finish quickly. So if we can uh, uh, generalize this analysis to care black holes, to rotating black holes. And, and this corresponds to a boundary ensemble, which has finite temperature and also some uh, uh, rotation parameters. So there are some interesting uh, differences here. So if we have the geodesics on the equator, uh, then we have two photon spheres now, one for prograde and one for retrograde orbits, which means it's going with the black hole or against it. Um, and, and another interesting thing is that for extremal rotating, uh, uh, rotation parameter, the uh, prograde uh, photon sphere is actually on the horizon. So it probes horizon scale physics. It's, it's not, in terms of uh, proper distance, it's not on the horizon, but in terms of the radial coordinate R, it is. So I don't know if you would consider that on the horizon or not, but in some sense it's on the horizon. Um, so in order to uh, uh, plot this picture, I'll take the four dimensional case uh, for simplicity. So for uh, geodesic in the equatorial plane, we get a, a very similar uh, plane wave ma uh, matrix, except, except that L is replaced by L minus A times E. So A here is the spin of the black hole. Um, uh, for non-equatorial geodesics, what happens is that uh, the matrix is no longer diagonal. And so uh, the oscillators actually mix. Um, so here I drew uh, the equatorial orbits in, in uh, four plus one dimensions, in, in a bulk four plus one dimensions. And we see that there's this, um, there's this uh, difference between the, uh, the, uh, the right moving singularities and the left moving singularities. And, and that's just the fact that the, uh, that the velocities on the two different uh, photon spheres are not, are not equal. So what about asymptotically flat black holes? If you're not interested in, in ADS CFT, you might ask what happens for asymptotically flat black holes. In this case, we can't really compute something like a boundary correlator, but we can compute the propagator at some large R max. So it is the propagator of, of two points on, on, on a sphere at large R max. And everything is, is, is essentially the same, except that geodesics cannot bounce off the boundary. And so there's only this one, uh, this one branch here. And it just, again, it approaches a, a straight line at a large, a large phi and a large t. And again, the singularity is, re is resolved by string theory. So, uh, so if you were able to actually measure this, um, two-point function on the light cone, you could say if there were strings in the theory. Because if alpha prime is non-zero, uh, then 
the uh, sorry, this should be the magnitude of the Green's function on the light cone is is finite. And so, uh, and that's a pretty sharp uh, 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 criterion. I'm not saying you, you could actually measure it, uh, but if you could, um, if you could say something about uh, the, uh, the stringy behavior. Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap up. So our goal here was to understand the singularities of the thermal two-point function. Uh, we found some non-trivial singularities in the holographic setting, and then we showed how they are actually resolved in string theory. So this uh, suggests that in general, the only singularity is on the boundary light cone. However, of course, it's interesting because as you, as you go to larger and larger lambda, it looks like there's a new singularity. So there's some new, uh, uh, some new physics there. So I, I only talked about the two-point function. Uh, for something like the four-point function, uh, we could have a bulk point singularity and a, and a light cone singularity in the, in the same correlator. So that, uh, there could be some, in, uh, some interesting interplay there. Uh, you could also try to add some charge to the uh, situation um, and, and see what happens uh, to the light cone. And finally, of course, it would be interesting to, instead of uh, deriving this from the bulk, uh, to understanding uh, to understand these results from the CFT perspective, um, in particular, to, is there any way to understand the emergence of the singularity and its resolution uh, uh, directly in uh, in n equals four degree angles in four dimensions? Um, so those are some questions that would be interesting to um, investigate. And uh, I'll stop for questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Ask a question uh, about the kind of whole setup. I think you said exactly the answer to this, but I just and I'm but I didn't hear it, and I'm guessing I know it, but I want to check. Um, if we had just set ourselves the task of propagating strings in a ADS Schwarzschild black hole, we wouldn't know how to do that because uh, because the string world sheet theory on that background is not a conformal field theory. And you got around that by just focusing on the neighborhood of one null geodesic in which you do have a conformal field theory. Is that correct? Well, it's a conformal field theory because it's it's a critical theory, but it's not a solvable theory. It's it's not something that we uh, that, uh, that we know how to how to analyze. So in the in the Penrose limit, we know how to anal analyze it just because it's quadratic. So it's 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 much simpler. Uh, wait. So you're saying. Actually, in principle, it's it's defined perfectly well in ADS Schwarzschild. It's just a computational yeah, construction. It, yeah, it's a computation. Yeah, there, it's not clear how to start. I that. thought there was something about you know string backgrounds have to satisfy this beta function vanishing condition, which yeah, so it, wouldn't actually hold for ADS Schwarzschild. Well, so it, it in it's a vacuum solution, so. I think it's fine. Oh, you mean uh, some external uh, dilettante? I no, I, I think it's a. It's I a, think Tesla is worried about higher order in the beta function condition. I thought ADS. Yeah, ADS Schwarzschild is not an exact oh, solution. Okay. ADS is exact because oh, of particular property of curvature. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that could be another possible issue. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. So is your singularity uh, should be resolved uh, because of the infinite tower of the higher spin particles, or could it come from uh, that artifact of that effect? Uh, large n, or so I mean. So the is your singularity discussed in your talk? Uh, sh should it should they be uh, resolved only through the uh, tau the massive higher spin particle like string, or can it be resolved by other uh, stuff like artifact of large C? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. So what happens with the bulk points? I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure about this situation, but I can tell you the answer in the in the bulk points uh, situation. So at weak coupling, um, you know. 
strings kick in before loops. And so what happens in the bulk point is that the answer is uh, cut off by strings and uh, a finite uh, uh, G Newton plays no, effect, uh, plays no role in that case. Mm -hmm. If there's a weakly, if, if there's a not weakly coupled bulk, uh, then there could be some interplay between large and, and large lambda. Uh, but I would, I would expect a similar situation here, but I haven't, uh, we haven't computed anything, anything in loops. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Any more questions? If not, let us thank Matthew again. Thank you. Thanks.